Good morning, everybody. This is Jackie from cornersoapshop.com, and today I'm making four batches of my shea butter soap. Hope you'll follow along, and if you have any questions, just ask them in the comments area, or if you go to my website, you can send me a, an email there or a text message from the phone number that's listed there. So we're starting out with distilled water, and I measure out the correct amount based on my soap recipe. I use the lye calculator located at Majestic Mountain Sage, and for this particular batch, I'm measuring out 35 ounces of water. Actually, you know, I'm not gonna tell you because you need to run your recipe based on your oils through the soap calculator, the lye calculator, and if I give you amounts, then you maybe won't do that, and then the batch of soap is not gonna be safe. So just know we're gonna do this by the book. And when I say that, I mean by my book. Um, you'll notice I'm not wearing gloves, and that's a big no-no. Uh, when you first start, and it's probably safe, you should do it every single time. Put on your rubber gloves. Um, guys, I've just been doing this for 25 years, and I'm extremely careful. And you know how it is. I'll be extremely careful till I'm not, and then I'll end up with a chemical burn. Um, anyway, what we've done here is add our distilled water to our, this is a plastic bowl that I got from Dollar Tree uh, 20 years ago, probably. They're really great. They've got pour spouts on them. I'd like them for these smaller batches. So add the water, then add the correct amount of lye to the water, not the other way around. The other way around can result in a lye water volcano, which means that liquid and lye that's in your bowl right now shoots up in the air and goes all over and just creates big problems. Now, I'm also not measuring the lye into a separate container, which would be the safe, smart thing to do. Um, again, go really uh, slowly as I approach the number that I'm going for and then I stop. Again, lots of years of experience and, um, you know, do I mess up ever? Yeah, occasionally, and then I just do a double batch and split it, but I don't, that doesn't happen very often. Once a year, maybe. Not a big deal. You will notice that I put my safety glasses on first thing, and then as I began mixing the lye water, I did put my mask on. And this is an N95 mask that you can get at any hardware store. And it just filters out the, um, the noxious smell that I personally can't stand the smell of. It makes me cough. Some people do this without a mask. Those people are usually outside when they're mixing. I am downstairs in my soap room, which is in the basement, and I do have a big exhaust fan that you can see just barely the light from it um, there to the upper left of the screen. And it pulls out lots of fumes, but it doesn't pull out everything. So I put the mask on once I start mixing the soap, and I keep it on till the lye's all dissolved. So I'm a small batch soap maker, and when I make a batch of soap now, I'm making 28 bar batches, and I'm doing four different scents at a time. That's my typical day. On this particular day, I have four small batches that I'm working on. So today I'm actually making six different scents of soap, two of the 28 bar mat batches, and then four batches that will be roughly 12 bars in each batch. So this particular workspace is two long counters separated by an electric range. 
and I use the stove top to do my double boilers up on top and if I occasionally do my oven rebatch for my bar of the everything but the kitchen sink soap then I use the oven to do to heat up my what I call end pieces and the beveled edges off each bar of soap I make to make everything but the kitchen sink. On one side of the stove, that would be to the right of the stove, underneath where the plastic containers are that you see in the distance. I have shelves and that's where I keep all of my lye. I keep um, all my different size double boilers, my big stainless steel pots, and a bunch of different um, plastic bowls like the type you see here where I'm mixing my lye water. Underneath where I'm working now, I have no shelves, but I have my 50 pound pails of lye on uh, little dollies. And I also have then my extra olive oil, palm oil, um, gallon jugs of distilled water and a fire, fire extinguisher. Okay, so we are six and a half minutes into the process this morning, and I have all of my lye water measured out, and now I'm gonna move all those containers over to the stove top. You'll notice after I pour each one and add the lye to it, I mix it. And if you mix it sooner rather than later, it's just easier for that lye to dissolve. And I give all the other, the four bowls total that I've got going here, I give them all a good stir so that they will all dissolve. You want the lye 100% dissolved before you proceed. And what I do is I kind of let them sit there and then I'll come back and I'll stir them periodically. It only takes a few minutes. And at this point that I'm at now, I really could take the mask off, but I generally don't think about it till I start getting kind of hot and starting to feel like I'm suffocating. And then I'll finally remember to pull the mask off. But now I'll go ahead and pull the intersection of one of my double boilers out and we're gonna start putting our oils in. When I duck off camera here, what I'm doing is I have a roller cart that has my shea butter, my olive oil, my castor oil. Um, I have a box now of palm oil. Sometimes I get the palm oil in 40 pound uh, pails. Right now I'm getting from Azure Standard, just their organic palm oil in a box. And so this is the shea butter. This is where we're starting. And I'm measuring that out. I put the pot on the scale, my digital scale, and zeroed it out. So I'm starting from a zero countdown. And I will put, guys, my hands are clean. Everything is clean. I use my fingers a lot when I'm measuring out these oils to get them off the spoons. And... Uh, the knives, whatever I'm using to get the, the oils out of their boxes. In this case, I put a little bit too much in, so I'm digging a little more out. And then next I'm gonna pull out my big container of castor oil. This is actually kind of a secondary container. I buy castor oil from Columbus Foods, Soper's Choice, and 35 pound boxes. And so this just is about a gallon of castor oil at a time that I decant from that box. This particular container, the drips start down the side. So there you'll see me use my finger to put it back into the container. And the first of many paper towels that I will be using during the day to keep my hands clean. Next up is my olive oil, and right now I'm getting um, my olive oil from Sam's Club. It's the three liter containers of olive oil, and yes, the price of olive oil is still pretty expensive right now, and I hope that comes down shortly. I read an article not too long ago that talked about the oil production 
and Spain is the biggest country that produces olive oil and they are having a great harvest this year so hopefully that will impact the price. Um, some of the smaller producers um, are having pest issues and weather issues which is it's typical somewhere around the globe there's going to be something that will impact um, the harvest which then impacts the price that we pay. Now what I'm doing here this is the end of one of the boxes of my organic sustainable palm oil and I'm just trying to get as much out of that that bag as I possibly can before I open the new box. And then I'm going to move this over to the side that box and the blue liner and I will use a spatula later in the day to clean that blue plastic liner of all of the palm oil and put it in the new box and what I'm doing right now is I gave everything a quick stir as far as the lye water goes and then I'm moving those containers down onto the other countertop so they can start cooling off just a little bit um, when you do hot process, you do not have to keep track of your temperatures. So that's one of the main differences between hot process and cold process. Um, and I like it for that reason. Your lye can be any temperature, your lye water, and your oils can be any temperature. Um, typically, when I put the double boilers on, I don't add my lye water until the oils are nearly 100% melted. Um, if there's you know, one blob of oil still floating in there, that's perfectly fine. Um, I haven't played around with that too much um, as far as adding the lye water, you know, like when the oils are only half melted. It only takes a few minutes and, you know, maybe I can answer a couple emails while I'm waiting for all the oils to melt down. Now, I am apparently trying to find a knife or something. Oh no, I was trying to get my uh, ladle for the palm oil so I can continue scooping the palm oil into this stock pot. And keep in mind when I started doing that, I keep an eye on what the how much I have put in already. So I've got that either written down or in my mind in case my um, scale goes out. Um, if the battery's low, sometimes you'll lose power and you just need to know how much you put in. So I do keep a really close eye on that. And I'm measuring pretty much exactly whatever the recipe calls for. If it calls for 40 ounces of um, a particular oil, that's what I'm measuring into the pot. And then I'm hitting the tear button after each one. And then next up is coconut oil, and I'm using from Sam's Club also their organic coconut oil. And in my basement, this is frequently solid and sometimes extremely solid at room temperature. So today it's solid, but it's still very pliable, so it will be pretty easy to get the oil out of the container. Sometimes I have to take my two containers up and kind of nuke them in the microwave just for a few seconds to get them to loosen up just a little bit against the plastic. And I'm just taking the top off of a new container of coconut oil to get it started and that's going into the trash there. And here we go, adding our correct number of ounces to our pot of this organic coconut oil. And this is unrefined, so it smells really good when it goes in. And no, you cannot smell that after the soap has cooked. The smell totally goes away. And you're not going to be left with coconut scented soap. It's going to be whatever scent I decide to put in um, when I'm adding my essential oils and my fragrance oils. I'm about at the end of this container, so I will try to get out as much as I possibly can. 
but then I'll save the container and again I will take that upstairs and microwave it for about 10 seconds to get the rest of the coconut oil in there to loosen up and then I'll add that to the new container that I'm about to open. These containers are not any fun to open even when your hands aren't full of oil but when you're opening one of these new ones that you can't get a grip because your fingertips are full of oil. It's not any fun. I end up um, just stabbing the inner liner with a knife and then pulling it off that way. That's the only way I can get a good grip. I should have a contest to see how many paper towels I use during a, you know, basically four hour uh, day of soap making. It's a few. Um, here we go, I finally grab my knife, give it a stab, and then start pulling it off. And again, keep in mind, I am watching the scale. I know how much additional coconut oil I still need to put in, just in case the battery times out and I have to add it later. And if that does happen, you have to take this big pot off and then I have a couple smaller bowls that I would just put the additional in and then add it to this the soap pot later. And here I'm just kind of alternating before scooping some out with a more rigid spoon. This is like a big tablespoon versus my rubber spatula here that I'm not able to get as good a grip on what I'm trying to get out of the container. And just again, once you are using the scale, it won't go off, but it's just when the scale sits there with no changes to it that you have to worry about the scale zeroing out on you or, you know, going, going dark. So now I'm going to take my, uh, the bottoms of the double boilers, and these are full of water. They're not full of water. They're, they have about two, two and a half inches of water in them. And I'm gonna get those on the stovetop and get all four burners going. And I have basically two big burners on this stovetop and two little burners. I start out the little burners on a higher temp than the bigger burners and try to get everything heating up um, relatively at the same time. Um, I'd like to get all four batches, uh, you know, going about the same time so they'll be finished about the same time. And now I'm filling these double boilers with, I've got empty water jugs that I keep my um, water in and that's what I'm going to fill them with and this is kind of funny I'm looking around for my fourth stock pot and I realize I remember later that I have been cleaning the mineral deposits out of one of them and that pot is actually upstairs um, it's actually out on our carport sitting with you know, full strength vinegar in it, um, trying to dissolve those mineral deposits. So I finally figure that out and we get going. And I don't have any water, um, running water down here in my basement. So what I've been doing, and I think it's kind of ingenious, is using my dehumidifier water to top off these bottoms of the double boilers. Um, it's just kind of a great way to recycle that perfectly good water. So I'm going to get this last little bit into this blue bowl and get it into the last couple of pots and then I will move this completed pot over to the double boilers and let it get started. Now I do have lids for each of these pots and I don't always use them in the summertime but in the wintertime it's a necessity 
and it's just it's too cold in the basement it takes a long time to bring all these oils up to temperature if you don't put a lid on it if you have a you know a well air conditioned and heated space then that's not as much of a problem so here I am again and I'm just going to speed through this next filling of these next soap pots with the same process shea butter castor oil olive oil palm oil and then the coconut oil and I will put some time stamps in the description if you want to speed ahead to the part where it gets a little more interesting as the cook starts you're more than welcome to do that So that has taken us to about the 35 minute mark, roughly. And this is the point where you're going to have a little bit of downtime now while you're waiting for the oils to melt. And I do different things at this point. 
Um, in this particular case, I have already pulled the oils that I'm going to be using to make sure I've got the proper amount of essential and fragrance oils to make the six different kinds of soap I'm making today. But what I've done is I've grabbed my worksheet and now I'm grabbing out individual recipes for each of the six soaps. If you're new to my soap, I generally have four different categories of soap making. So my recipe box, then I use the four different neon prints of recipe cards, one for florals, one for food scents, one for fresh and fruity, and then one for the earthy scents. And then I do have some white recipe cards and those are for the unscented soaps and anything that's um, a specialty item. And it can be non-soap recipes like a, a salt scrub or a sugar scrub, lip balms, my bath teas, that kind of thing. So in this recipe box up at the front are my soap recipes. I'm going to pull out a card for each of the soaps. And then I'm going to consult those recipe cards and make sure that I've got all of my additives so for instance, if I were making my lavender facial soap, I would need ground oatmeal, a rose clay, and ground lavender to go in it. So I'm going to pull those ingredients and get everything together that I need. You'll see here, I'm just checking the pots to see how we're going. I'm adjusting my um, temperatures of the double boilers. I want the double boiler to be at a simmer so sometimes it takes a while to bring all that water and obviously what's in the double boiler up to temperature so I do kind of keep an eye on it and um, put the temperatures up and down just based on how how much of a how close I am to a simmer and on this particular day I'm having trouble locating my unscented coffee soap recipe that I make, you know, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. And so it's pretty important that I have the exact formula for it so I can replicate it. And it's not something that you just, you know, do try to do based on my 62 year old memory. Um, it just doesn't you, you've got to have consistent products, and if you were to do that, um, you know, somebody that used it 10 years ago gets the bar of soap expecting it to do a certain thing, and then you change the recipe, and it doesn't work. So it's really important that you have recipes that are tried and true, and in this case, that's what I've gone to get. It's my, out of my freezer upstairs, I have frozen coffee and triple brewed coffee and some coffee grounds that are going to go into this particular soap. I'm going to be moving my camera angles a couple different times throughout the day just to give you a better picture of what I'm looking at. So here's the view looking at the stock pots as they're coming up to temperature and nothing much going on yet so we'll just let them continue to simmer away and we'll move you back over to my scale and i have these little one cup pyrex measuring bowls that i use for all of my different scent blends so this part is just like cooking you're just gonna follow your recipe add you know however many ounces of your essential oils or fragrance oils that you need and then set that dish aside when you're completed and you'll notice I'm working on a piece of freezer paper that I've doubled over and what I do is each time I finish a particular scent on the paper, I write what the name of that scent is, and then if there are any additional things that I need to add to the scent blend. So, for instance, um, that may have been the lavender spearmint. I'm not sure which one that was, but if I need um, oxides to go with it, I will write, for instance, green and purple, 
And if there's goat milk, I'll put a like a GM notice little notation on the paper right next to the dish so I know what else I need to add to this before it's done going into the mold. And guys, I am going to speed this up also through all of these five different scent blends that I'm going to be putting together. I've already pulled out the coffee one, so that one's done. But I'll speed through this and I'll put that in the timestamp again. So if you want to join me later. So we're about 45 minutes into the process now, and these first two pots are melted enough that we're going to go ahead and add our first container of lye to the melted oils. And then we're going to use our stick blender to mix that up. Now, again, notice not wearing gloves. Don't do this. If you're a new soap maker, please wear gloves. This is dangerous and this stuff will burn you if it hits your skin. I'm very careful. I know where every drop of that liquid is going to go. And even when I'm using the stick blender, everything is very controlled and I'm just careful. I've had a lie accident years ago. Um, probably 15 years ago. I know what it feels like. It's not any fun. You'll notice my hands. I don't have, I had a soap maker friend that had chemical burns all over her, her hands and that's not me. I'm just very careful. But if you're new to this, you definitely are going to wear gloves because you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. So just be careful. So I am stick blending each of these pans until I hit trace. And for this soap making, this much soap, it takes about 30 seconds of hitting it with the stick blender. And this is another difference between cold process and hot process soap making. I don't care about any air bubbles that are in this mix because over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to stir all of those air bubbles out. So I am just going to town with the stick blender to get all of these oils incorporated with the lye water. And once that happens, you'll notice your stick blender starts to leave a trail as you're using it. And you'll see me kind of slow down. Um, towards the end of the 30 seconds and just make sure that I'm hitting trace and that's when I stop stick blending. And then we're going to repeat the process for the other two soap pots. Add the lye water to each pot and I always do this in the same order so I'm sure not to double up on the lie into one pot. It's the same exact order each time so I don't make any mistakes. 
and then here comes that stick blender again to give each of these batches a good whisk. I'm going to speed forward a little bit here too and I'll bring you back in once the soap pots need to start being stirred down. So that's when the chemical reaction starts becoming noticeable. So our elapsed time now is about an hour from when I came down and got started. And I'm gonna start pulling these lids off to check and see our progress. And this first lid, you'll see kind of the edge of that soap has rolled over. And what that means is that there's now gas bubbles that are forming below the colder surface of the soap. And what you want to do is you want to keep this soap all stirred together so the temperature of the soap is roughly the same throughout the bottom to the middle to the top layer. And so the more that you stir it, the more that these oils and the lye water will all be at roughly the same temperature. Now you'll notice I am using the same wooden paddle to stir all of these batches and that's because this particular day all of these batches are the same soap the same base so i am just going to reuse the same paddle there's no sense or anything in these soap yet so you can just reuse that paddle the second two soap pots are going to take another five minutes or so before they're ready to be stirred down. So what I'm gonna do is move over to the far right of my work table, and that's where I have my spool of butcher paper, and uh, I keep a ruler over there, a yardstick, so I can measure out the butcher paper that will line my soap molds. So I'm gonna move over here to the side, and I will start cutting four sheets of, um, in this particular case, 24 inch long pieces of butcher paper to line my molds. And I'll show you how I do that in a few seconds. Now here's the most important tip I can tell you. Do not go very far when your soap is at this stage. The length of time it takes for a soap to go from no chemical reaction to boiling over is just the matter of about 15 seconds. So it's really important that, especially when these lids are on, now the lids will imp impede a boil over, but they will not stop it. So I'm going to keep, you know, stopping what I'm doing over here on the side and coming over to check at what point the soap is getting to. And I'll do that non-stop just to make sure. Um, you'll notice there, I think, okay, 
let's get this one boil or stirred down a little bit and the one in the back is going to take a little bit longer so I'm just constantly checking it because if you've ever boiled soap over soap when it's in the pre-soap stage is still oily so it's not fun to clean up and you waste material and it's just not a good thing so I do try to be really careful when I'm working at soap in this very beginning stage of the cook process and now we'll speed things up a little bit And right here is a really good example of how quickly the soap can start to boil up. And this one I've caught in plenty of time to get it stirred down. So what you're doing is you're keeping all of these molecules in touch with each other. So you keep that chemical reaction controlled. If the chemical action proceeds on its own pace, it is typically going to be faster than you want it to be. So if you keep it stirred, it will be more controlled. And that's what my goal is, is to keep all the molecules in touch with each other and at a roughly constant temperature. So the back, the last soap pot is still a little behind these others. It will catch up, but that's going to be kind of my process now. Every couple minutes, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to take the lid off of each pot and then stir them down. And I'll continue doing that. It will reach a point where most of your chemical reaction, this what we call champagne bubbles um, stage, it looks like applesauce if you look at it. It just it's got a, a very unusual consistency, but it, it's just this phase where there's a lot of chemical reaction going on and so a lot of gas bubbles escaping. And you just want to be very diligent in the amount of time that you spend stirring down your pops pots of soap at this point. And I'm going to speed this up again as we're proceeding through this very active part of the cook time. And you'll see I'm pulling some additional bowls out that will be used when I separate the four cents that I'm going to be making into smaller batches. And at another point, I'm not sure where it is here, but um, you'll see me doing... Um, some other little things to get ready for these pots of soap to come off of the, the burners. I set up some hot pads down on the far end of the work surface. I have some silicone mats set up, but I do set some hot pads on top of those also. So now I feel like I can step away a little bit from the soap pots because all of that chemical reaction is kind of slowing down. 
So I'm moving over to a different work table where I've got my little mold stuffer set up and I basically will wrap that stuffer with my butcher paper and then that I put into my molds which are sitting down on the floor. That's one of my molds. I'm sorry that's not a very good view of that. But I remove the stuffer, the paper stays in the mold, and then I'll tape it into the mold in a few minutes once all four are done. And I do walk away here. Um, I'm going back over to the soap pots. I'm stirring all four pots and then I'll come back and I'm going to speed through this process for you too. So our soap has been cooking for roughly about a half an hour now. Things are slowing down a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and finish lining my soap molds. I've got a big yardstick that I use to push this freezer paper, butcher paper, down into the mold. I'm going to cut all four corners of the paper that sticks out of the, the soap mold. And then I tape it down on two of the edges just so when I pour the soap into the mold, the liner stays in place. If you don't do that, the liner can bunch up and create um, little wrinkles on the edges of your soap. And generally, I'll do one or two molds and then I'll step away, stir down the soap, and then come back to it and finish these molds, lining these molds. And I'm going to speed through this also. And then back over at the soap pots, we're just going to continue to stir down this fluffy looking soap. And at this stage, it starts to become what I like to call the mashed potato stage, where as the bubbles start to lessen, the soap looks more and more like a pot of Yukon Gold mashed potatoes. Just do not try these because it's still active lying in there. <laughs> You'll burn your stomach. So don't eat it. Don't eat the soap, guys. Now, I, I am going to speed this up again at some point, but what I'm doing is I'm just keeping an eye on the pots and then doing little projects that won't take me very far away as I'm doing it. So that's what you'll see me step away every now and again and Maybe I'm cleaning, taking a Clorox wipe to a spot on the floor or a spot on the stove or whatever, just doing little busy projects to keep the place clean and keep me busy.
So if you watch the whole thing here, you'll notice the two soap pots in the foreground. There has been nothing going on. There's no rising of the soap mix in the pot. And that's the first indicator that basically that soap is done. Now, I'm an old school soap maker. I still do um, tongue tests to make sure the lye is all used up. I do have my pH test kit. I just don't ever use it anymore. It's just, to me, just as effective to tongue test the soap to make sure that it's done. And I can tell just at this point, those two pots are done. And very shortly, the third pot there on the right will be done also. So I have a rubber spatula then for each of these soap scents. And I'm going to scrape the pots down. And then I'll take them out of the double boilers and set them on my work area off to the right. And at this point, I'm going to pull each of these double boilers off of the burners, turn the burners off, and put the pots on the cold concrete floor. Um, I do have my de the dehumidifier running while I'm making soap. Um, lots of, obviously, boiling water, so lots of humidity in the air. Great for your skin. It's like getting an hour and a half long facial while you're making soap, but it's just... Uh, probably a good thing to use your dehumidifier and have that going if you're doing um, double boiler hot process soap making. And then the same thing, the pot there on the right side hasn't had any movement for several minutes. We're going to tongue test it and then that's going to get pulled off. The one to the back you can still see it's kind of foamy looking and it's much more active. And it's probably going to take another 5-10 minutes um, before that one's ready to come off. So, and part of the reason that this back burner takes longer, it is the small burner. So, once I get rid of this soap pot, I'm going to move that soap pot up to the bigger burner and turn off the back burner. And then I'll speed us along to when this pot comes off.
That actually took another 11 or 12 minutes to get to this point. I'll tongue test it, use my rubber scraper to scrape all the sides down, and then that will go off to the side also with the three other batches that are cooling off. Now this cooling off period is going to take roughly an hour and a half, um, give or take. And I set a timer for every, at first every 15 or 20 minutes and stir each pot down and keep, you know, keep the hot stuff up on top and keep it cooling off as quickly as I possibly can. But while I'm doing this, um, I take a batch of dirty dishes upstairs and wash them. So like the dishes, the bowls that the lye water was in and any utensils I used and getting the oils into the soap pots, that all goes upstairs to get washed. I might also sit down at the computer and uh, change the quantities on the soaps that I'm making today on the website. I might print the labels, or I may just get on my phone and uh, play Mahjong for 10-15 minutes. And I'm definitely going to speed this up because this is like watching paint dry. Um, no reason that you shouldn't skip ahead if you would like to, but I am going to be running up and down the stairs and doing all kinds of little projects. I'm also like I pulled out my goat milk, um, the powdered goat milk that I use, and I'm going to run that up to the microwave upstairs and get the water heated up so that that's ready to go into the batches. I've got my colorants laying there on the side next to the stovetop that I'll give a quick shake so those are ready to go. And basically, I just try to be ready once the temperature of these batches comes down to roughly 145 degrees that's when I will start adding my colorants and my essential and fragrance oils to the soap and then get it in the mold but here we go let's speed this up So now fast forward a little, I have separated one of the batches into two bowls basically. And this is the first soap. It's the unscented coffee soap. It has triple brewed coffee and coffee grounds in it. And you're just gonna mix it. It's uh, simply getting those coffee grounds as evenly distributed in the soap as possible. Although I'm not opposed to leaving a little bit of a swirly mass to it. Um, I try not to. It's, I think, a better product if it's more evenly spread out. But I kind of like the look when it's not even. I'm much more of a rustic soap maker than a pretty soap maker. That's just me. And then this one is ready to go in the mold. Now the unscented soaps, you do not have to cool them to whatever temperature you work with. Like I said, I go for about 145. It can simply, there's no essential oil going into this. So it's not like you're trying to preserve a fragrance or an essential oil by getting it too hot and burning up the fragrance. 
So this is just going to go into the mold and then I'm going to uh, plop the mold onto these concrete floors, forcing any air bubbles out of the um, soap and wait for the next batch to be cooled enough that I can add that to it also. In this case, I put a layer of freezer paper in between the layers and then I'll have a 12 bar batch on the bottom and a 12 bar batch on the top. And then I'll separate them when I go to cut them. And the next batch of soap is a, another half batch. And this is a new scent blend I'm trying. This one came about because of basically a bunch of new recipes I was trying for summertime. And two of the recipes in particular had basil and mint in them. And just fantastic flavor, which often translates to a fantastic scent blend too. So here we go. Basil and mint, or mint basil really in this case, it's predominantly mint. So um, I'm coloring it in somewhat unusual colors. In this case, a pink, a light pink with a little bit of green marbled in it. And basically I would have liked to have done like a purple and green, but I already have a soap that is that same um, combination. So I would like to do things that are a little bit different. And so this one ended up pink and green. Now I do what's called marbling. Um, hot process soaps of this consistency, which most are when they're done cooking. This is that heavy mashed potato type stage that I was talking about earlier. It's really hard to color the soaps in a pretty swirl fashion. So my soaps that are colored are done more in a marbling type fashion, which you'll see how I do that right now. And you're just going to very gently, almost like folding in cooking, just fold the two colors into each other, allowing plenty of the uncolored soap to kind of serve as white space in the soap scent. And this one is done, ready to go into the mold. And we'll get that into the second part of this mold that I just filled up. One of the reasons that I like doing hot process soap is that you can use much less colorant and much less scent than the cold process soaps. And scent and color are things that in many people are sensitizers, so they become ingredients that cause people issues with their skin. So if you can use less of any particular scent or essential oil, any certain color, it's a really good thing for people in general. So I, I've always liked the fact that the soaps are just wonderfully good for your skin. They're moisturizing, they're uh, gentle, and they have great lather. And that's all done without added chemicals. It's just because of the combination of oils and butters that I use in the soap. And look what's coming up. Oh, you didn't see it. I didn't anyway. But this is why you wear eye protection. That could have gone into my eye and I would have ended up in the ER again. This soap, it's 150 degrees. It will burn your skin and in particular the very soft sensitive tissue of your eyeball. <laughs> so I'm really careful when it comes to putting on eye protection. Like I say, less so when it comes to protecting my hands, just because I feel I'm really careful in that regard. And it's something that until you really learn how your ingredients are going to react, you need to take precautions to cover up as much as you can. You don't want to end up with a chemical burn. So our timer must have gone off because I'm just, again, stirring down these soaps again to help them cool off. And as I do that, I'm also scraping the sides of the, the pan where the soap has hardened and it sticks to the pan um, as it cools. So you're just making sure that you're keeping all of the soap incorporated and roughly at the same temperature as it cools down. If you neglect to stir in the soap on the sides, it doesn't 
um, take the fragrance as easily as a warm soap does and it won't definitely won't absorb any of the color so if you just mix it back into the hot soap then you're just fine now here's one of our little half batches and this process just follows what we've done on the last couple of batches here so this is um, I believe the eucalyptus essential oil that's going in and I'm going to speed through mixing that up and putting it in the mold And here's one of the big batches. I must have uh, not turned the camera on to mix up this particular batch, but this is my lavender spearmint soap, and this is a really good seller, so I only do big batches of that. And same kind of process that we went through earlier, mix the fragrance into the soap very thoroughly, and then I add a green and a purple colorant, the oxide type colorants, into the soap in two different areas in the soap and then just kind of fold them together to get the marbled look. And we'll speed through to the end of getting this into the mold and tamp down. And this is the final batch that I've got. This is the final big batch that I've got going into the mold today. And again, I did miss, um, I think, one of the little batches of soap going in, and I actually didn't film this one going into the mold, just mixing it up. So this is a citrus blend. This is probably my very favorite soap of all, and the clay-like, kind of the grayish substance in there is bentonite clay, and this is a shaving soap. So if... I am doing my legs in the shower. Bentonite clay helps the razor slip on your skin. It just very minutely picks up the um, razor off the skin so it will slip and it will not nick you. And this, like I said, it's my favorite soap, so it's the one that's most often in my shower. So I made that into a shaving soap. And it obviously works on facial beards just as well as it works on other body parts. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed and learned a little something from this full day of soap making. The total process of soap making to the end of this video was three hours and seven minutes. So the additional time that it took to actually put this into the mold and tamp it down and then clean up what's downstairs carrying all the pots upstairs to do the um, dishes to clean them up it probably adds another half hour so say three hours and let's just say 40 minutes uh, start to finish and that would yield four 28 bar batches um, and like I said today I did it a little differently because I was doing four small half batches that are really 12 bar batches so it's been fun being here with you. If you guys have any questions, just leave them in the comments area and I'll do my best to answer them. I've been a soap maker for going to be 26 years this fall and have been selling them since the year 2000, primarily at art and craft shows um, in and around Florida and eventually branching out all over. I sell my soap on my website at cornersoapshop.com. Thanks for being here, guys.